The core idea of test-driven development is that you write your tests before you write the actual code. Today I'm going to show you how that works and what the benefits are. But there are also some things you need to watch out for. If you're new here, you want to become a better software developer, gain a deeper understanding of programming in general, start now by subscribing and hitting the bell so you don't miss anything. In this example, we have an employee class that has a name, an ID, and some fields related to payments. I used the flow type for payments. I think normally in a production environment you wouldn't use this because it's not precise enough. You'd probably use decimal or int or something like that. So next to pay rates, there's hours worked, a fixed employer cost, whether the employee has a commission, what the commission is and how many contracts the employee landed. And then there is a compute payout method. So you can imagine that you have some kind of HR system that calls this method for each employee and then computes how much the employee should be paid. So I haven't implemented compute payout yet. We're going to do that later and follow the process of test-driven development. Test-driven development or TDD is a term coined in 2002 by Kent Beck in his book, Test-Driven Development by Example. I'll put a link to that book in the description below. Test-driven development consists of five steps. The first step is that you write tests. When you add a new feature, you basically start by writing the tests that only pass if the feature specifications are met. And this is actually a very important benefit of test-driven development that it forces you to think about the requirements before you start actually building something. The second step is actually running those tests and make sure they all fail. It's important that these tests fail because you want to check that you're actually adding something new and that the tests are properly testing that part. The third step is writing the simplest code so that these tests pass. It doesn't have to be perfect in this step, you just make sure that it adheres to the specifications. You're going to clean it up later. The fourth step is to make sure that all tests now pass, including any other older tests that you have. This ensures that the new feature adheres to the specifications and it doesn't break other things. And then the fifth step is refactoring and improving the code while you have the test harness running. So you make sure that you always have passing tests while you're doing that. So this is the main process of test-driven development. And you can repeat this cycle of writing new tests, making sure they fail, writing the code, making sure tests pass, and then refactoring over and over again. And if you're working in an agile setting, you should do this in small incremental steps and make commits very often. The process of writing failing tests first, then write the code that makes those tests pass, and then refactoring the code to improve it is also called red-green refactor. So let's apply that to our example and see how it works. I've already created a basic structure of the test that we're going to use in this particular example. There is a test employee compute payout class that aims to test the compute payout method of the employee class. There's already three tests in there. One that tests that the payout returns a float. One that the payout is correctly computed if there is no commission and no hours worked. And one if there is 10 hours worked and no commission. There is a setup method that creates a test fixture. That's basically the data that a test uses. In this case, each test needs an employee instance. Now you could also create this employee instance as part of the test, but the setup method is a nice way to make it a little bit more concise. Next to setup, there is also teardown if you need to clean up things after running each test. For example, maybe a test generated files that you need to delete, or there's a database connection that you need to close things like that. Remember, setup is called before every test. So in this case, we have three tests. So this is going to be called three times, one time for each test. So I'm using the assert methods of the unit test library to check things. For example, here I use assert is instance to check that the result of compute payout is a float. I'm using almost equal to compare the payout with a constant. The reason I use almost equal is that there are some rounding errors with floats and I don't want to have my test fail because of a rounding error. So again, in a production environment, you'd probably use decimal, but for simplicity, I'm using float here. So the first two tests simply use the employee object that's created by the setup method. In the third one, we're changing it a bit because we're setting the hours worked and then doing the check. So let's add a few more tests here. One thing I'd like to test is if the employee receives a commission that this is computed correctly. 
So we're assuming the employee had 10 contracts that landed and 10 hours worked. So let's set the contract landed value to 10. And then we assume that the payout is going to be, the commission default is 100, so we're expecting this to be 3000. And let's add another test to make sure that disabling commissions also works as expected. This is what we get, and then the expected value is 2000. So now we have a nice little number of tests. So this was the first step of test-driven development, writing the tests. Second step is running the tests. So let's run these tests and see what happens. So now we see we get five errors. All tests fail. And this is important to check that we're sure that the tests that we're adding, that they're actually testing new functionality. Now the next step, and that's when we're moving to the green part of red green refactor is that we start implementing the method in employee and then you'll see that step by step these tests are going to pass so let's start implementing the compute payout method so i remove this not implemented error and then let's start writing the code so as first step let's compute the payout and that's simply the pay rate times the hours worked and for now let's just return the payout. So this is not complete because we're not taking care of commissions, we're not taking employer cost into account, but let's see what happens when we run the test again. So now you see that some tests are starting to pass. We only have four failures instead of five. Let's add the employer cost and let's run the test again. Now we see we only have one failure and of course what's still missing is the whole commission stuff. So let's add a line that if there is a commission, then we add that commission times the contracts landed. And now let's go back to the test. And now all tests pass. So now we are in the green phase of red green refactor. Now that the tests pass, you have an environment where you're sure that your code adheres to the specifications and you can move around things and change things and make sure that this still works correctly. For example, what you could do is decide that employer cost is too generic and you want to split that up in a few different variables. So let's say we have employer office costs, which is $200 per month. We have employer 401k costs, which is 400. And we have employer sport costs, which is another $400. And we're going to remove this. And now let's change the compute payout method to take into account these new costs. There we go. So now we refactor this a little bit. And now let's run those tests again to make sure we're still adhering to the specification. And we do. This is how red green refactor works. And to finish this off, I have three tips for you on how to write good unit tests and a couple of do's and don'ts. But before we dive into that, let's first talk about the pros and cons of the test-driven development cycle. Why is test-driven development so popular? Well, first, and I mentioned this already in the beginning of the video, it forces developers to think about requirements first. And that means you need to make sure that your feature is defined well and that you know exactly what it needs to do because otherwise you can't write the tests. So this forces developers to think about their interfaces first as opposed to just starting coding away. The second benefit of test-driven development is that even though you probably have to write more code, it might save you a lot of time overall because you're detecting bugs much earlier. And you probably know that if you're Debugging your code, this might sometimes take a long time before you find the problem and having those tests there is really going to help you find those bugs sooner and that will save you time. Finally, a third benefit is that if you start by writing tests, you force yourself to write code that's easily testable. And that means you'll be more inclined to use 
design principles and design patterns to write code that's easy to extend and easy to separate from other parts of the application. And that just makes your code in the end much easier to maintain. There's also a few things you need to watch out for. First is that writing and maintaining lots of tests is going to take time. If you're working at a stable company who knows what their product is, who knows what their users want, and this is not particularly an issue, because anyway, it's going to help you with debugging faster and keeping the system stable. If you're working at a startup though, in particular an early stage one, then adding all those tests might become a big overhead. And it's going to be a waste of your time if anyway, you're going to completely change your product and throw everything away that you did. So you have to find a careful balance there. The second thing is that if you've written many passing unit tests, you might have created a false sense of security for yourself. And you may not put as much effort as is needed in other testing activities, such as integration testing or end-to-end -end testing. And finally, often the developer that writes the test is also the developer that writes the actual code. And that may lead to blind spots. So it's always a good idea that especially if you are in a team, that you separate the work of writing tests and writing the actual code between different team members, because then you have less chance of developing these blind spots. Another possibility, if you don't do that, is that the developer misinterprets a part of the design and implements the feature in the wrong way, but then also tests it in the wrong way. And then you won't find it out until Perhaps it's too late or the client starts complaining that it doesn't work as it's supposed to. Let's look at a few things you shouldn't do when writing unit tests. Here I slightly modified the test that we have and introduced a couple of things that I think you shouldn't do. So the first thing you should watch out for is reusing the same data in multiple tests. Ideally, you want your test to be completely decoupled, completely independent from each other. You don't want a change that you did in one test to affect the result of another test because then it becomes extremely hard to debug. What I did here is create a single employee instance that's used for testing. And then in the various test methods, this is the employee instance that I use. And that's a bad idea because now changes that I do here in this test have impact on what happens in this test. So if I forget to reset one of the values, then we have a problem. So overall, don't use these kind of global instances uh, and, and reuse them in different tests. That's the first tip. The second tip is that you don't need to test Python built-in functions. I added here a test that checks whether employee attributes are as expected. So what we expect is that the name is name, the ID is that, pay rate is that, etc., etc. And then I'm comparing these values with the values that are inside my employee to test instance. You don't need to do that because this is already defined by the Python standard library, which normally you can expect uh, won't have that many bugs. So you don't need to test that. The goal of your test is to test the compute payout method and not Python standard library stuff. The third tip is if you write a test, compare your output with a fixed value. What I did here is I created a compute payout method as a part of the test where I compute what I expect to be the payout. And then what I do in some of these tests is that I compare the compute payout method result with calling that test implementation on the same employee. The thing is that here I basically made a copy of the compute payout method that's inside the employee class. So in this case, I'm just comparing that copying a method gives me exactly the same results, which is weird. Right? So it might be tempting to copy over parts of the implementation to the testing class and then test the implementation against the reference implementation, but then you're simply comparing implementations. You're not testing the actual code. So always compare with fixed values. In my startup company, we've been adopting a test-driven development approach lately, and it's quite pleasant to work in that way. So I, I really recommend you try it. Writing those tests does take time, especially in a startup. You have to let go sometimes of trying to reach high coverage percentages. It's a careful balance between shipping something fast and buggy, but getting useful feedback from your customers quickly versus spending a lot of time on a feature and releasing it and then it's very stable, but you might not learn as fast as you would have needed. The nice thing about test-driven development is that you can make that trade-off explicitly because you can see how much coverage you have and how much tests you've written. In this video, I only touched the surface of software testing. There's a lot more to think about, like mocking, patching, different testing frameworks, different types of tests, etc., etc. And I'm surely going to do more videos in the future to cover all those things here. So 
that was it for today. Thank you for watching. Take care and see you next time.